In this video, we're going to look at a third way to write functions, and that is called an arrow function. An arrow function uh, provides a more concise way to code function expressions. So they're still function expressions, they're just a little bit shorter and a little bit more concise. I believe they're easier to read as well. So let's take a look at the syntax for an arrow function. So it starts out the same way a function expression did by declaring a constant with the name. And we have the assignment operator just like we had before, but now we don't have the function keyword right here. Instead, we just have parentheses with a list of parameters inside. After the parameters, then we have the arrow. The arrow is an equal sign followed by a greater than sign, and it looks like an arrow, uh, and it points to the function that these parameters are going to go into. So these parameters go into this code block right here. So the function disappears, the arrow gets added on the right side. We still have a list of parameters in parentheses. So let's look at this code from the last video uh, where we had a function expression to ca calculate taxes. And we had calculate tax as our constant equals, and then we had the function keyword with subtotal and tax rate, and then our block of code that multiplied and returned the tax. We can rewrite this as an arrow function by doing this. We take the function out, the word function, so calculate, constant calculate tax, that's the same in both of these, equals, the assignment operator is the same. We take the function out, we still provide the parameter subtotal, comma, tax rate, and then we put in the arrow, followed by the code block that's exactly the same as the code was when we did it as a function expression. And that's an arrow function. Easier to read, quicker, more concise. Let's look at some more examples. Here's an arrow function with one parameter. So we have a constant called calculate tax, and this one just takes a subtotal. It only takes one parameter. Now, one thing that you want to notice here is that when you're only doing one parameter, you get to leave off the parentheses. Okay, so if it's only one parameter, we don't need to use parentheses here. Followed by the arrow, and in this case, it's using a, a, a magic number here, constant built in to calculate the subtotal times 7.4% to, to do the tax. But when there's only one parameter, you can leave off the parentheses. You have to use the parentheses if there's no parameters, and you have to use the parentheses if there's more than one parameter. But if there's just one, you don't have to put parentheses around it. You can put parentheses around it if you want to, but you don't have to. So here's an arrow function with one parameter that executes a single statement. Okay. Notice here that this single statement doesn't have curly braces. Um, that's okay. You can use the curly braces like we did up here, um, but you don't have to use them. If somebody comes back to this function and writes an additional line though, that additional line won't be included in the function. So I tell newer programmers, even though you don't have to use the curly braces if there's only one line, uh, I highly suggest that you do it. And that's true in a lot of languages that let you do that. Uh, leave off the curly braces if you're only going to execute one line after maybe an if statement or in a loop. Uh, but I highly suggest that you keep the curly braces in there. Uh, because you can induce a couple bugs uh, if you ever go to modify your code that you may not have intended. So here's an arrow function with no parameters that executes one statement. This one's called get URL, um, and it's going to call the document object and find out the location uh, href, which is the hyper tag, hyper reference uh, for where we're, what page this is, basically. Um, this doesn't take any parameters, so they use an empty set of parentheses here. So if I want to call that arrow function, I can just 
call get current URL with an empty pair of parentheses after it. It will run this function, get the document location, and return it, and I can store it in a constant here called URL. So we've went through three videos on functions. We've talked about functions. We've talked about calling or invoking a function. We talked about function declarations. We looked at parameters. I didn't mention arguments so much, and I should have. So let's go back. These are parameters. These are the things inside of our functions. They're the variables that exist inside of our functions. Subtotal and tax rate inside of our functions are called parameters. When we call a function, we pass it arguments, and the arguments get stored in the parameters. So let me go find. So here is an example of that. We're calling a function called calculate tax. And I went back some, to some previous slides. When I actually call the function calculate tax, I'm passing in the 85 and 0 0.05. Those are the arguments that I'm passing. And those values get copied into these parameters. So the variables inside the function are the parameters. The values we pass into those functions are called the arguments. Uh, we talked about return statements. Uh, after a function does its calculations, it could return a value. Uh, that value could be anything that we might want to calculate. Uh, we talked about hoisting before, the idea that uh, variables are hoisted uh, the ver and constants are hoisted uh, before JavaScript runs, and that's true of constants that we're naming our functions with. We talked about function expressions and that we assign the function to a constant. Uh, we looked at arrow functions and their arrow operator. That will do it for our functions as far as theory goes. And towards the end of this chapter, we will actually put this all together and look at some applications that make use of all these things. So if you're getting a little overwhelmed right now, when we get to the end and look at some applications, it might help straighten some things out.